In this video, I'm going to cover Le Chatelier's principle. So a system that's at equilibrium tends to stay at equilibrium. And if it's disturbed and that equilibrium is unbalanced, then the equilibrium will shift in a way to offset that uh, disruption. So once a reaction is at equilibrium, the concentration of the reactants and products remain the same. But if those conditions are changed, then the concentrations of the chemicals will change until the equilibrium is restored. The new concentrations will be different, but the equilibrium constant will be the same. So remember we looked at, um, in the first video of chapter 13, some instances where we change the concentration of reactants and products. But whenever that system reaches equilibrium, the equilibrium constant is always the same. So the, the concentration of reactants and products will shift so that when you multiply them together, um, as the equilibrium expression dictates, then uh, we will get the same number for the equilibrium constant every time. So um, that's always true if we change the concentrations of reactants or products unless you change the temperature. So the equilibrium constant is always the same number, even if you change the concentrations, unless you change the temperature. And that changes the rate of the forward and reverse reactions. And when that happens, that also affects um, the equilibrium constant, the number of the equilibrium constant. So changing the temperature can change that number, but changing the concentrations doesn't. Le Chatelier's principle uh, helps us to predict the effect of changes in conditions have on the, pos the position of an equilibrium. So if a system, uh, a system that is at, so what Le Chatelier's principle says is that a system that is at equilibrium tends to stay at equilibrium unless disturbed, and if disturbed, the position of equilibrium will shift to minimize the disturbance. So if we add a reactant, if a system is at equilibrium and the reactants and products are balanced um, so that when they are multiplied and divided according to the equilibrium constant expression, they equal that, that number for K. So when that system is at equilibrium, if I add more reactant to the equilibrium, then when I do that addition, and what I'm actually calculating at that point would be Q, I would see that Q and K are not equal because I just added more reactant. The system was already at equilibrium, and then I added more stuff. So now Q and K are not equal, and this, the system is going to shift so that Q and K are equal, so that the, shift will, this, the system will come back to equilibrium. So if I add more reactant, then what that does is I have to remove some of that reactant or convert some of that reactant to product in order to restore equilibrium. So adding a reactant moves the reaction forward. If I remove a product and then I have less product, then I have fewer products than I need. In order to get more product, then the reaction has to move forward and, and reactants have to be converted to product. So there's two ways to drive the reaction forward that's at equilibrium by Le Chatelier's principle. If I add more reactants to a system at equilibrium, then I have too many reactants, and to get rid of them, the system moves forward to turn them into product. Or if I remove product, then the products are too light. I have too few products, and so the system will move forward and it will convert reactant to product to restore those products that I had removed. So equilibrium shifts away from the side with added chemicals or towards the side with removed chemicals. So it doesn't have to be about products and reactants. If I add reactant, it moves forward. It moves away from where I added. But if I add product, then the reaction is going to move backwards. So if I add to one side of the reaction, then the system moves away from the side that I just added to. If I add to, to product, it moves backwards toward reactant, and if I add to reactant, it moves forwards toward product to offset the addition, what I had just added. And uh, conversely, it moves toward the side with removed chemicals. So if I remove the reactant, then the product is going to be converted into reactant to replace what I just had removed, and vice versa. So changing the concentration, either adding reactant or product, or removing reactant or product, the equilibrium will shift in such a way to replace what was removed. 
So here is um, one way that we could represent that. If I have a system that's at equilibrium and I add more NO2, then I have the system at equilibrium looks like it has uh, one NO2 particle and two of these N2O4s, right? These, these uh, gray ones are the ones that are at equilibrium. So when I add these three new ones, now I have too many products, right? I'm at equilibrium. I add product. I'm adding more NO2. So if I've added NO2 and now the system has too many products, then the reaction has to move this way to remove those products that I had just added to rebalance the system. So the system shifts left. And how does the system shift left? Well, NO2 shifting left has to become N2O4. So two of these N NO2s are going to run into each other and they're going to create another N2O4. So these are reactions, right? N2O4, this particle can break in half to make two of these. Or the reverse reaction is two of these guys running into each other to make one of these. So depending on what happens in, in the in what way I've disturbed the equilibrium, whether I've added reactant or product or removed reactant or product, what I'm causing to happen in order for that equilibrium to be restored, I'm causing the chemical reaction to occur, right? If I have too many of these, how do I get rid of them? Well, they run into each other and they make this. If I have too many of these, then how do I get rid of them? Well, they fall apart, they break in half, and they make two of these. So that is, is the way that we would apply Le Chatelier's principle by changing the concentration of a system that's at equilibrium. So what happens if I add a gas to a reaction that's at equilibrium? Before, if we're changing the concentration, generally we're talking about solutions. So we're looking at a solution phase reaction. All of the reactants, or most of them, are AQ in their phase. They're aqueous reactants or products. Um, and pot potentially a pure liquid or a pure solid, maybe, that would, that would not figure into the expression, the equilibrium expression. But what about when we're looking at a reaction where the reactants and products are gases? Well, in that case, we um, aren't necessarily changing the concentration of reactants or products if we're, if we're changing the equilibrium, if we're going to disturb the equilibrium. If we uh, add gas or remove gas, we are changing the pressure of those gases. So um, if I add a, a gaseous reactant to a reaction that's at equilibrium, then I'm increasing the partial pressure of that reactant. So increasing the partial pressure is uh, going to basically change the equilibrium in the same way that uh, it would if I were adding uh, increasing the concentration of, a, of an aqueous solution. So if I in increase the concentration of reactant, then it shifts away from reactant toward product to get rid of what I just added. So the same is true of a gas. If I add a gaseous reactant, I'm increasing the pressure in the same way that I would be increasing the concentration. And so the equilibrium is going to shift away from the addition, away from what I had just added. So um, increasing the partial increasing the partial pressure of a reactant incre does increase its concentration if we consider that the volume of the gas um, is constant, and it does not increase the partial pressure of the other gases in the mixture. So remember that if um, by uh, Dalton's law, if I add two gases together, then their partial pressures remain independent. So at increasing the partial pressure of one gas by adding more of that gas does not affect the partial pressure of the other gases that are in the mixture. But if I add an inert gas to the mixture, then it's not going to affect the position of the equilibrium at all. Because I, if I add an inert gas, it's not changing the pressure of the other gases. And an inert gas, what that means is one that does not appear in the equilibrium. So if I have A plus B goes to C, and then I add gas D, gas D is not in that reaction. So gas D, adding it or removing it, does not affect the equilibrium. What if I change the volume? So if 
we are talking about a system that's at equilibrium and it's a, a system of gases then changing the volume will change the pressure of the of all of those gases um, but if I'm talking about a system at equilibrium that the solution the um, reactants and products are solutions they have their phases AQ aqueous solution then reducing or increasing the volume of the container does not change the concentration of the solutions right if I take a, a solution that's one molar and I pour it into a bigger container then I'm not changing the concentration but if I take a gas that's contained in a uh, 100 milliliter flask and then I put that gas into a 200 milliliter flask and I've just changed the volume of the flask it does change the pressure of the gases right the, the gases have a bigger space to move around in they're going to hit the walls less, less often and if they hit the walls less often then the pressure is going to decrease so when I increase the volume of a, a system of a gas that decreases the pressure right you make the container bigger then you've increased the open space in the container and if the particles are moving at the same speed then they're gonna have to travel through more wide open space before they hit the walls of the container so they'll hit the, the walls of the container less often and the pressure goes down the opposite happens if I decrease the volume if I if I take a, um, a, um, a system that's at 200 mils and I squeeze it down into a flask that's at 100 mils then I've taken those particles and I've reduced the open space that they have to travel through and therefore they'll hit the walls more often and therefore the pressure will go up so changing the volume is actually changing the pressure and if I change the pressure then I'm actually changing the pressure of the the products and the reactants and so if I change the pressure of the products and the reactants then in which way will the equilibrium shift because now I'm basically adding product and reactant so it, by doing that I'm increasing the total pressure in the system and so Le Chatelier's principle says that a system at equilibrium moves to reduce to um, decrease the effects of that change so by decreasing the volume I've increased the pressure and so Le Chatelier's principle says that system wants to decrease the pressure that I just added so the way the system reduces the pressure is to reduce the number of gas molecules in the container. So if there, if I have some particles in a container and I uh, decrease the volume of that container, then I've kind of squeezed those particles together and now they're going to hit the walls of the container more often because there's less space for them to move around in. So that's going to increase the pressure. And remember the pressure is how how many particles hit the wall per second for example and with how much force they're hitting the wall that's how that's what contributes to the pressure so if we can decrease the number of collisions of the in the wall per second then we can decrease the pressure so one way that the system can do that is by converting um, particles that uh, converting one type of gas into another type of gas based on the um, equilibrium and the way that uh, the system does that is that it shifts the equilibrium shifts to the side with fewer gas molecules so if the total pressure is increased a system at equilibrium wants to um, counteract that change and so it does that by shifting to the side that has the fewest gas particles so we can't just say that when I increase the pressure it's going to shift towards reactants or when I increase the pressure it's going to shift towards products when I increase the, sh the pressure the system at equilibrium is going to shift towards the side with the fewest gas molecules because having fewer gas molecules is going to decrease the pressure right because there will be fewer collisions with the wall so um, because there are more gas molecules on the reactant side of the reaction um, here in this reaction I have one mole of N2 and three moles of H2 so on the reactant side there are four total moles of gas and on the product side when these combine I only have two moles of gas right some of these H2's stick to the ends and I make two of these NH3's so on the reactant side there's four moles of gas on the product side there's two moles of gas when I decrease the volume 
then I've increased the pressure. When I've increased the pressure, then the system shifts to the side with the fewest gas molecules. So it will shift to the right because there's two moles of gas on the right and four moles of gas on the left. But if I move this piston up and I increase the volume, increasing the volume of the system decreases the pressure. And if the pressure has been decreased, then the system wants to shift in a way to increase the pressure. So how does it do that? Well, then it's going to shift towards this side of the equilibrium because if I have four moles of gas that are at the same temperature, so they have the same average kinetic energy as these two moles of gas, four moles of gas will have a higher pressure because there will be twice as many collisions with the side of the wall because there's twice as many particles. So increasing the volume or changing the volume, I should say, changes the pressure. When you change the pressure, the system changes either toward the, uh, toward the side with fewer molecules of gas or toward the side with more molecules of gas. So we've talked about what happens when we add or remove, um, or if we change the concentration of reactants or products. We've looked at what happens when we change the partial pressure of reactants or products just by adding a single gas. It kind of reacts in the same way as changing the concentration. And now we've seen what happens when we increase or decrease the volume by uh, so changing the total pressure of the system. So in those cases, in each of those cases, um, the system is going to shift toward the side that counteracts the effect of the change that we just that we just had, that we ju the way in which we just disturbed the equilibrium. So how does temperature affect an equilibrium? Well, exothermic reactions Well, exothermic reactions are those that release energy as heat and endothermic reactions absorb energy as heat. So when we change the temperature of a system at equilibrium, we're either adding heat or we're removing heat. And what that does is it changes the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction. And when we change those rates, then we're going to change the, uh, the value of the equilibrium constant. So when there's more, when there's more energy available in the system, or if, I, if there's less energy available because I'm removing heat, um, then the system is going to uh, change the concentration of reactants and products. And it's going to do that in a way that depends on the nature of the reaction, whether um, it's an endothermic or exothermic reaction. So one way that we can predict the change is by writing heat as a product um, in an exothermic reaction or writing heat as a reactant in an endothermic reaction. Then we can treat the heat, the temperature change, just like we would with a re as a reactant. So let me show you what I mean. So here's, let's look at this reaction. I can say that here's a reaction and it's exothermic. If a reaction is exothermic, then that means that it's releasing heat. If a reaction is releasing heat, then heat must be a product, right? So I put a heat on this side in an exothermic reaction. So let's look at the ways that we can change this reaction right here. If I add N2 gas, what happens to the reaction if it's at equilibrium? Adding N2 will make the reactants too heavy, so the, the reaction will shift this way, which means I'll generate more NH3 and more heat. What happens if I remove H2? If I remove H2 from the system, then the reactants are too light. I have too few reactants. So what happens? Well, the reaction moves this way. It moves to the left. And NH3 and heat are converted to N2 and H2. So I can make more H2 that way, replace the H2 I removed. Conversely, over here, if I add NH3 gas, then the products are too heavy. It shifts this way. If I remove NH3 gas and I take it out of the system, now the products are too light. So the reaction moves this way, shifts towards the right. So those, that's what happens when we change the concentration or the partial pressure of a gas, a system that's uh, composed of gas reactants and products. So with heat, if I, the first step when I'm trying to determine the effect of heat in an equilibrium 
is if the reaction is exothermic, I should write plus heat on the product side. If a reaction is endothermic, I should write plus heat on the reactant side. And then I can predict the, the effect that a change in temperature will have by treating heat just as a reactant or product. What happens if I add heat to this reaction when this reaction is at equilibrium? If I add heat, and heat is a product, then that means the products are too heavy. If the products are too heavy, then the reaction shifts this way towards the left to remove the heat that I just added. So what happens if the system is at equilibrium and I remove heat? Then the products are too light. I've removed some of the products, heat being one of the products. So if I remove the heat, then it's too light and the system is going to shift to the right to replace the heat that I just removed. So determining what effect changing the temperature is going to have on an equilibrium depends on whether heat appears on this side because adding it drives it to the left and removing it drives the reaction to the right or if heat appears on this side because then the opposite will happen if heat is a reactant and I add it I'll drive the reaction forward if heat is a reactant and I remove it I'll drive the reaction backwards so here's another reaction where heat in an endothermic reaction heat is a reactant so if I add heat the reaction moves forward if I remove heat the reaction moves backwards to replace the heat that I just removed. So we can see that when we take a tube that's full of N2O4 gas, the, there's only one gas in there and this gas is somewhat unstable. So that means that if we heat it up, that bond between the nitrogen atoms breaks and I get two NO2 particles kind of fall apart, right? So when it's really cold, those nitrogen atoms like to stick together. So when it's really cold, that means I've removed heat when, because heat, uh, cold's kind of like the, the opposite of heat, right? I've removed all the heat. I put the tube into some ice water and all of the heat that was inside of the tube moves to the water. All the, the, uh, the two systems try to, to reach thermal equilibrium. So if the tube is hotter than the ice water, then the heat moves from the tube into the ice water. So eventually, when those have reached equilibrium and the tube then doesn't have much heat left in it because it's really cold, it's like the, the, the temperature of the ice water, then at that point, those nitrogen atoms are a little bit more sticky. But then if I take the tube out of the ice water and I put it in some warm water, 26 degrees, it's a little bit warmer than room temperature. So then I put it in some warm water. Um, then I've added more energy. So as I add more energy, this N2O4 particle starts to vibrate more and more and more. As it heats up, it vibrates more and more. Remember, the bond between two atoms is kind of like a spring. So when it's cold, the spring vibrates really slow. But as I heat it up, I add heat, that, that spring starts to vibrate more and more. So as it vibrates more and more, that bond is eventually going to break and a higher proportion of these particles will break in half and turn into two of these particles. So then, I, if a, since the reaction here is endothermic, it requires heat to break this bond. Then if I add heat by putting the tube in warm water, it drives the reaction forward. I make more brown gas. The reaction turns brown because this, this gas is brown. But if I cool it down, then those two nitrogen atoms become kind of sticky to each other again. I cool it down, I re remove the heat. By removing the heat, that makes the reaction go back this way. So then I make more of the colorless gas. So we can change the color of the gas in the tube by changing the reaction by adding and removing heat. So finally, we've talked about the effect that co changing concentration has, the effect that changing uh, volume has, the effect that changing temperature has, and now finally, um, what effect does a catalyst have on the position of the equilibrium? So we've seen the effect that catalysts have on the rate of a reaction. So remember that the effect that a catalyst has on the rate of a reaction, that the rate of a reaction is based on the activation energy, right? So the forward reaction has this activation energy without the catalyst and the reverse reaction has this activation energy without a catalyst. And when I add a catalyst, what it does is it reduces the activation energy. It reduces the energy at the transition state. So doing that means that the activation energy of the forward reaction is now much smaller, 
and the activation energy of the reverse reaction is now much smaller. So the since the rate is based on how high this hill is, that means the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction speed up. But you can see that changing the uh, height of this hill right here changes the the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. It decreases the activation energy for the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. So since they both speed up, and they both speed up to the same extent, then adding a catalyst does not change the concentration of reactant or product at equilibrium. It changes how quickly we reach equilibrium because the reactions speed up, but it doesn't change the amount of reactant or product to have at equilibrium. That amount is based on this difference right here. So the amount of, of reactant and product that I have at equilibrium is based on this difference, delta H. Right, this is our enthalpy here. So if I'm not changing the potential energy of the reactant or the potential energy of the product, and a catalyst doesn't, it only changes the energy of the transition state, if I'm not changing this energy or this energy, then I'm not changing the value of delta H. And if I'm not changing the value of delta H, then I don't change the equilibrium. The, um, the equilibrium constant is going to be the same, and the forward and reverse reactions are going to speed up by the same factor. So the concentration of reactant and product stays the same. Catalysts do not affect the position of the equilibrium.